Welcome, I'm Catherine Hadro, and this is a special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Celebrating 200 episodes, four years since our launch, we look back on stories that have impacted the pro-life movement and look forward to the work we still have to do. We're joined by EWTN CEO and Chairman of the Board, Michael Warsaw, and the President of the Susan B. Anthony List, Marjorie Dannenfelser. Where are they now? We check in with a former Planned Parenthood director who won a $3 million lawsuit against the abortion giant. Hear what she's up to today and how she's exposing the lies of the nation's largest abortion business since we last spoke. And Micah's mission. We speak with Micah Pickering and his mother, Danielle, to hear how they are continuing their family's journey of pro-life advocacy after the pro-life issue touched their family in a personal and powerful way. Today, as we celebrate our 200th episode, we take a moment to look back and forward on the mission of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Since our launch four years ago, this program has spanned one president's full term, the departure of two Planned Parenthood leaders, and the confirmation of three Supreme Court justices. Welcome to our special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Since launching in early 2017, there's been no shortage of stories to cover here at EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Over the past four years, we've tracked shakeups in the abortion industry, from the departure of longtime president Cecile Richards. I'm announcing that I will be stepping down from my position as president of Planned Parenthood this year. To the breakneck speed in which Dr. Lena Wynn was enacted president and then ousted within less than a year after saying she intended to make Planned Parenthood focus less on abortion. Congratulations. There have been moments that shocked the nation when New York Governor Andrew Cuomo lit the World Trade Center pink to celebrate his extreme abortion law. And who could forget those now infamous comments from Virginia Governor Ralph Northam that sounded like a defense of infanticide. Um, the infant would be delivered. Uh, the infant would be kept comfortable. We've documented the moments in which our pro-life movement pauses to reflect and have tough, important conversations. The world is watching us. They want to see how we're going to respond, and they want to know if we care about the pain that so many are feeling, especially in the Black community. Then there have been the historic pro-life accomplishments, from Capitol Hill to the steps of the Supreme Court. In our four years, we have reported on the nomination and confirmation of one, two, three new Supreme Court justices who are largely viewed as respecting the right to life. We continue to speak with members of Congress. They talk about choice. Choice to do what? Hmm. Dismember and decapitate an unborn child. Catholic Church leaders. Killing children in the mother's womb, just as killing children outside of the womb, is not something we need revelation to understand is wrong. And cabinet officials. What we need to recognize as a country is that this is our best resource, our people. We've also heard from hidden pro-life heroes and those who help shape and influence our culture. From a biblical standpoint, uh, the, the support for the pro-life position is pretty strong, but it really is science that I find to be the, the best argument. Looking ahead now, we know we will stay busy with our pro-life mission as we report on the many stories to come with a Catholic president who is pushing an aggressive abortion agenda. And EWTN Pro-Life Weekly would not be possible without our next two guests. Michael Warsaw is chairman of the board and CEO of EWTN. Marjorie Dannenfelser is president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Welcome back to you both. Congratulations on the 200th episode, a collective congratulations. Uh, I first just love to hear your thoughts as we look back on our first 200, uh, because this really is a fruit of your vision. Uh, Michael, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's wonderful, you know, and, and it's hard to believe, mm -hmm. you know, frankly, that we're, we're here four years later. Um, but I think the work that this show has accomplished mm -hmm. uh, during this, this incredible time, as you just uh, reviewed in that previous piece, um, the, the, what the show has accomplished and, and what's been able to be done here, 
uh, I think has been significant. I mm -hmm. think the show has been a significant voice mm -hmm. uh, in the public square for issues of life, which mm -hmm. is exactly what we wanted it to be mm -hmm. uh, when, when we first talked about this type of show and, right. and this partnership that has brought us together. Mm -hmm. Marjorie, what's going through your mind as we look back on the first 200 episodes? Oh, I remember thinking there is no group of people more that could be more influential than the EWTN community in general. Mm -hmm. And how we talked a little bit about how do we collapse the distance between them and what's happening on Capitol Hill and at the White House mm -hmm. and in legislatures across the country and, and the pro-life movement in general so that they could be really even better uh, advocates for this cause. And I think what we've seen so providentially that these four years have been among the most, I would say probably the most consequential in the entire pro-life movement. We're stronger four years uh, than four years ago than we, uh, that, m that strength has increased in that period of time more than any other time. Um, and you have been here um, not just documenting, but inspiring, uplifting, activating, uh, raising voices at just the right moment. And I think that we have a, still a lot of work to do, but we have so far set out what I believe you accomplished to do, which was re-engage everybody at home in the battle at hand to save lives. It's really incredible all that's happened the past four years. And Michael, we are in a different place today than we were four years ago when this show launched. For one, there's a new president in the White House. You wrote a recent commentary in the National Catholic Register, and I'm gonna read part of that quote. Quote, President Biden campaigned as a Catholic and throughout his career has often cited his Catholic faith as his guidepost. Yet the vision he articulated as a candidate and which is guiding both his administration and his party puts him squarely at odds with many of the church's teachings, especially on the preeminent issue of the defense of unborn life. Michael, can you speak to this moment in history for Catholic Americans when it comes to the pro-life issue? And perhaps what opportunities does this present for EWTN News and EWTN Pro-Life Weekly? Well, I think I think the position taken by President Biden, uh, both throughout the campaign and, and now that uh, he's in the White House and directing policy, um, is very confusing for Catholics. Um, and, and I think um, you know, it's very clear that while the president and his spokespeople like to talk about how devout of Catholic he is, um, in, in point of fact, his positions uh, on the life issues especially um, just simply are not in line with Catholic teaching. And I think we've seen, uh, you know, our bishops try to grapple with this. I think we've seen uh, the tensions within the church as we try to deal with this and, and understand uh, what this means. I think for us and for Pro-Life Weekly mm -hmm. and for EWTN, I, I think this is a great opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's a challenge, yeah. but challenges are also moments of great opportunity. And I think it's for us to redouble our efforts and our mission to be very clear and to make very clear to all who listen uh, what the church's teaching is and that life is the preeminent issue. I don't think we can say that mm -hmm. often enough. Right. Uh, and, I, and I think that's what's missing um, mm -hmm. in, in certainly uh, you know, this administration and in mm -hmm. certain quarters of the church mm -hmm. where uh, there, there seems to be uh, a tendency to want to uh, you know, try to go along to get along. Uh, we can't. We can't uh, pursue some sort of artificial unity just for the sake of unity uh, when there are fundamental issues here that, that uh, the issue of life that we have to speak out on and continue to speak out on and continue to engage on. To speak truth amidst this confusion, Marjorie, given President Biden's aggressive abortion agenda, what do you see as a priority for the pro-life movement and for Catholics right now? What do you think Catholics and pro-lifers need to be honed in on? Well, I couldn't agree more with you, Michael, and that clarity is a gift. To know exactly where um, we should stand, uh, where our uh, opponents in this case, where the President of the United States stands, is he in contradiction to, the, to our faith, to what we believe, or is, is, he in, uh, or is he with us? Clearly he's not. It's important for us to see that. So what we should be honed in on, in my opinion, is number one, not to be distracted with all the disappointments of late that our greatest strength is in what we have already accomplished in the in the last six years and that is through the supreme court over 230 new judges across the federal court system and all of the massive number of legislative pro-life pieces of legislation coming up from real people in real states that want their voices and their opinions expressed in the law 
that huge amount of legislation coming towards the court at just the right time in history means that there is a lot to hope for but one thing we must do mm -hmm. and that is to make sure that on the federal level in the Senate mm -hmm. that we make sure that the filibuster stays in place and that basically comes down to Senator Joe Manchin and mm -hmm. maybe a couple of other senators if he changes his position on that that means that they can stack the courts they can change the makeup of the Supreme Court which mean ev which means everything that we've worked for will be taken away and that the that the founders balance of powers between the three branches of governments is completely unalterably changed in a way that makes it a policy uh, a policy reaction not a steady rudder for democracy in terms of being invested in the constitution so staying mm -hmm. focused on that that uh, filibuster rule mm -hmm. and then also looking down the road not too far toward all this legislation coming up and being supportive of, of that in your state right now. Mm, the stakes are high. Michael, you knew E.W. Chan foundress Mother Angelica very well, and we found a powerful clip of Mother uh, back in 2000 speaking about the issue of life. Let's take a listen. It's an abomination to God, the culture of death. An abomination to God the culture of death. You don't have a right. I don't have a right. Nobody has a right to call death upon someone God has called to life. Strong words. Michael, can you speak about Mother Angelica's conviction for the life issue and having known her so well, what do you think she'd make of this time that we're living in right now? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I think Mother was very clear Mm -hmm. uh, as that uh, as mm -hmm. that piece showed um, in her support for life and and the importance of life and the life issue mm -hmm. I think uh, because of her own personal sufferings mm -hmm. and her own the depth of that suffering and all of the things that she went through in her life physical sufferings emotional sufferings all of these things um, yet you know she was able to do these remarkable things through God's providence and I think that gave her just a, a unique insight when it came to the issues of life and the value of life and the importance of every life and, and the meaning that every life created by God brings. Um, and so I think it, I think it, it motivated her to be strong and, and vibrant and uh, you know, to, to defend life at every stage. You know? and, and so I think um, she would be very, very proud of this show. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she'd be very, very proud of you and the work that you do um, oh, you. that represents that, that legacy of Mother Angelica, that, that, that strong defense of life. I think when it comes to these days, I think she would be exactly you know, where, where we saw in that piece. I think she would be um, encouraging us you know, in a way to, to mm -hmm. building off of what Marjorie was saying. Um, that, that all is not lost and, and this is not, you know, a time to be, uh, you know, down. Uh, it's a time to push forward. It's a time to be even more vocal and even stronger and more strident mm. in our fight for life. That's convicting. Marjorie, uh, throughout these four years, we've also heard from pro-abortion critics. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, now majority leader, has tweeted out clips of the show. NARAL has listed us under anti-choice media. Do you take this as a sign that abortion activists are threatened, perhaps, by what we're doing here? No, oh, I have to tell you, that is sweet music. Although I just love reading those quotes. It means you're getting under their skin. The gift that you, Catherine Hadro, have been to this movement through the show. I am the chair of the Catherine Hadro fan club, if you want to look me up. It's not um, club. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a huge club out there. And, and you yourself and the message that you're sending is getting under their skin. Um, when SBA was tiny, tiny, and I started to get some of that feedback, I thought, oh, yes, let's mm -hmm. keep, let's, mm -hmm. because w really what it means is not getting it under somebody's skin is important, but you don't necessarily know that you're really making any uh, headway until they, until they start to scream, mm -hmm. and that is exactly what they're doing, and, um, you know, I'm really proud of you. I really am. Well, I'm grateful to you both. <laughs> this has just motivated me further to continue on for the next four years. <laughs> Thank you both, Marjorie Dannenfelser, Michael Warsaw. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, where are they now? We check in with past guests who have powerful pro-life stories, including a former Planned Parenthood director turned pro-life advocate. 
plus an update on the little boy who is the face and name behind a pro-life bill. Welcome back to a special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. As we celebrate 200 episodes, I'm Katherine Hadro. Over the course of our 200 episodes, some of the most powerful stories we've shared have been the testimonies of former abortion industry workers, people who have been on the inside and got out. I couldn't stay quiet. I was very vocal when I saw things going wrong, and I was known for that. You know, if I see something going wrong, I will say it. We spoke with former Planned Parenthood director Myra Rodriguez in September 2019, one month after she won $3 million in a lawsuit against the abortion giant for being wrongfully terminated. Rodriguez worked at Planned Parenthood for 17 years and was fired after raising ethical and legal breaches happening there. So where is Rodriguez today since leaving the abortion industry? To find out, let's speak to her directly. Joining us now on Skype is Myra Rodriguez, former Planned Parenthood director turned pro-life advocate. Myra, welcome back. It's been over a year since I've last spoken with you and since your lawsuit victory. So much has changed since then, and I understand you are on a mission to make abortion unthinkable. Can you tell us a little bit more about your pro-life work today? Yeah, believe it or not, Catherine, my life has been busy from home, right? We all stayed at home all this year. The pandemic made it a little harder, but we made it through. I've been cooperating with a lot of organizations across the globe, especially in Latin America, since there's been an attack on legalizing mm -hmm. abortion from Mexico to Argentina. So we're working um, every day, all the time, just sharing my testimony. Wow. Myra, after leaving the abortion industry, you have been working hard, as you shared, to expose Planned Parenthood. What should everyone know about Planned Parenthood? You know that they harm women. They have women during the abortion. Their abortion is a business for them. The abortion industry, it's a giant, multimillionaire industry that doesn't care about women that they advertise that they're caring for women, but they are not. Their main goal is money and money. Mm. Myra, as you reflect on your journey working at Planned Parenthood for 17 years, being wrongfully terminated, winning your lawsuit against Planned Parenthood, what do you believe is the mission that God has you on right now? You know, for the longest, Catherine, it took me a while to understand how I was so blind. You know, and then the lovely priest that has been my spiritual guidance in Phoenix made me understand that I had to go through all that to, to do God's work today, you know, to spread the, the word, to spread the truth about abortion, and then hopefully women will see it unthinkable. That's so powerful, and it sounds like you've been so busy looking ahead. Myra, what can we expect from you and your pro-life work in the future? You know, to work with all the organizations that work for life, you know, to help the teens um, not think as abortion as an option, you know, to make it unthinkable from home, you know, to tell our young kids at home that life is precious from the moment of conception through the natural death. Mm, that's incredible. And can you just share a little bit more, Myra, about what are some things that you're doing to share the truth about Planned Parenthood? That's quite a battle. Yeah, it has been. So, for example, in Latin America, I work with some of the people in the Mexican Congress to express the truth about Planned Parenthood. Because I don't know if most of you know this, Catherine, but Planned Parenthood exists across the globe. They just go with different names. IPPF, International Planned Parenthood, is the head of a lot of organizations in Latin America. They just change their names. So they have more affiliates than McDonald's and Starbucks. So that's how big they are. So I'm spreading the truth about who they are who they are behind those organizations that pretend to be uh, this helping women in all those uh, countries in Latin America and over the globe. That is such important work. And thank you for really opening our eyes to how Planned Parenthood, that's not just the biggest abortion business in the United States. They are throughout the globe. That's a really important mission. Hope to talk with you again soon. Myra Rodriguez, God bless you and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Catherine. God bless you. This week, Representative Chris Smith introduced the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. It would ban abortions at five months of pregnancy because science shows that's when babies can feel pain. The bill is often referred to as Micah's Law. 
named after Micah Pickering, a now eight-year-old boy who was born prematurely at 22 weeks. I first met Micah in 2017 and spoke with his parents about how they fought to keep their tiny but mighty baby alive. This is the person that is inside that womb. You know, there is a person in there that will grow up, that will, you know, smile and laugh and play and, you know, that you'll be able to hug and kiss and just be able to love. And that person is worthwhile. The eight-year-old's Pickering requires a little bit more sleep than most kids and had a speech delay at first, but he is a thriving son and brother today. The Pickering family told me they feel a responsibility to God to share their witness and lobby for the pain-capable bill because Micah can be a face for unborn babies at 20 weeks. To catch up with the Pickerings, we are joined by Micah and his mother, Danielle, via Skype from Iowa. Good to see you both again. Danielle, I know your family has come to our nation's capital multiple times to advocate mm -hmm. for the pain capable bill or MICA's law, but you've advocated for the bill at the state level lately as well, haven't you? We, we just try to get the word out there everywhere we can. You know, we just try to make it all about the babies and do whatever we can to protect them. That is a really important mission. Uh, MICA, do you like being able to share your powerful story and how God has worked in your family's life? Do you enjoy it? <laughs> that's a yes, that's a great head nod. Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> incredible. And Micah, what grade are you in now? Second. Incredible, it's so good to see you almost four years since we last spoke. Uh, Danielle, your family has had the spotlight on you from being on Capitol Hill to being featured in the New York Times. What do you want people to take away from your story and your journey with your son, Micah? Oh, we just want to take away hope that where there is life, there, there is hope. And these, these babies are precious. And every single day we have fought to give them as much hope as we can. And we know that um, life is precious and it's from the Lord. And we just want to give every child a chance to, to have that hope of a future. Well, that leads right into my next question, that theme of hope, because Danielle, so often there is not a lot of hope when babies are born so prematurely. Micah was born at 22 weeks. Danielle, can you just offer a word of hope to pregnant mothers who may be watching this right now? Um, yeah, for sure. We had about a 5% chance of survival with him. And we had about a 95% chance of life altering disability. And we were looking at, you know, major medical complications, major brain function issues, all of these things. And all of those things were things that we were willing to conquer because we knew that we loved our child. And we prayed and we had hope that you know, with God's grace that we would be able to, to get through everything that was um, going to be in our future and every single minute of it was worth it for him. Mm. God's grace is sufficient. Danielle, I mentioned leading into this segment that Representative Chris Smith has introduced the pain capable bill into the House this week. That is, of course, known mm -hmm. as Micah's Law. What do you want to say to members of Congress who are considering whether or not to sign on to Micah's Law? We just want to say that these are not just statistics. These are babies and these are people and these are the future generation of this amazing country that we live in. And so take that very carefully into consideration that we're not dealing with numbers. We're dealing with people and we're dealing with a soul and a heart and the future, you know, of our country. Wow. That's really well said. Well, God has given your family a big and important mission. It was so good to see you both again, and I hope to talk to you again soon. God bless you for your work, Danielle and Micah Pickering. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our most watched EW Chan Pro-Life Weekly story online with nearly 3 million views on YouTube is the story of little Jackson Buell. Even our genetic counselor, who was supposed to be neutral, mm -hmm. steered us more towards an abortion or termination, as they called it. Right. And even we denied it, and they mm. scheduled it anyways, just in case we changed our minds. Mm -hmm. 
those are the parents of Jackson Buell during our 2017 interview telling me how they chose life for their son despite doctors' warnings and a scary prenatal diagnosis. Jackson was born in 2014, missing about 80% of his brain. Against all odds and doctors' predictions, Jackson was born alive and then continued to live a beautiful life until he died last year at the age of five and a half years old. Jackson's father, Brandon, sent us a statement as we honor Jackson. It states in part, quote, Jackson's legacy is that he beautifully personified and gave the world the perfect example that every single life has value and a purpose, no matter how short that life may be or how difficult someone's journey. God created Jackson exactly how he intended, knowing that his life and story would impact so many lives. He continues, we knew from the beginning Jackson's time with us would likely be far too short, but in that time, while creating lifelong memories with him, he also made us better people. The Buell family says now every year on Jackson's birthday, August 27th, they will gather in his memory and choose a family, child, cause, or group to financially support that year. What a beautiful legacy of love, and it's one of my greatest honors. I was able to meet little Jackson. Well, that does it for this special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Thank you for joining us for our first 200 episodes, and I hope you'll join along for our next 200. Until then, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. we love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.